Hi, my name is Dr. Jared Keller and I'm an emergency physician. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to take off my mask so that the audio is a little bit better, but keep in mind during a pandemic, we should probably be wearing our masks. In today's video, we're going to talk about putting in ultrasound guided peripheral IVs. Now, this is becoming a hot topic, especially because there are a lot of patients out there that really fall into the category of tough sticks or they're difficult to place an IV on. So during this video, we'll be talking about how to do that successfully. For further reading or further uh, study, there's actually another video out there, uh, EM in 5 by Dr. Seidel, which I encourage you all to take a look at. I'll see if I can't send out an attachment for you so you can find it a little bit easier. With my training at LA County Hospital, we had machines like this, and we had a lot of training on ultrasound. Ultimately, I placed many of these. I have a lot of experience and a lot of things that I can share with you that I think will help you be more successful in this process. Now, I can never remember that many things, so I try to keep things down to five. Any more than five, can't remember it. Any less than five, it's probably too simple but I've created a mnemonic for you to kind of help you go through this process successfully. PULST, so P-U-L-S-T, a little bit different. P, positioning, U, ultrasound knowledge, L, long angiocath, S, structure identification, and T, technique. In the following videos, we'll go through each of these individually so that you know exactly what you're doing before you do it. The first topic I want to go over is the P portion of pulse, which is positioning. There's a saying that's very important in emergency medicine, which is fortune favors the prepared. In this circumstance, the more time we spend preparing for doing this procedure, the less effort that will actually be needed to do it. So there's a few concepts that I want you to remember. First and foremost, when we're preparing to put in the ultrasound guided IV, there's uh, some people like to be sit sitting, some people like to be standing. In this case, I like to be standing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make use of the bed and we're gonna pump Chris up here all the way to the top. This is my, my guest Chris who is gonna be helping me today. But I'm gonna pump Chris all the way up to the top so that I don't have to hunch over in order to put in this IV. All right. The next step is I want all of his blood circulation to be in the upper half of his body, which means that we're gonna put him in Trendelenburg, meaning head down. So, Chris, go down. That way we're draining all the blood out of his legs and into his upper body. You can even tilt the, tilt the head of the bed up so they don't feel quite like they're gonna slip onto the floor. All right? The next step is I'm gonna hyperextend his arm. So keep in mind these angiocasts that we're gonna use are very long. Ultimately, having a bent arm is gonna make it a problem for putting that whole needle and that whole catheter into their arm. So it's super important that if I'm going to have him do this, I want his arm to be hyperextended. Very simply, just put something underneath their arm so it's nice and extended for you. I don't have a tourniquet on him, but while you're preparing, one of the things that you can do to help yourself is apply the tourniquet. I know that there's a stigma that we don't want the tourniquet applied for too long. Keep in mind, tourniquets can be applied up to a few hours without any deleterious effects in the future. So just a few extra moments here will actually help engorge the veins and make your target nice and big. We're looking for a basketball hoop, not a, not a golf ball cup, all right? So we have him nice and extended. We have him in Trendelenburg, getting all of our blood flow up into the upper extremity. The next part of positioning here is where am I gonna put the ultrasound? One of the things people I've seen people do is put it on the opposite side of Chris over here so that as I'm putting in the ultrasound, I'm looking at the, the monitor as well. And that's great, except that if I have to adjust the monitor, I do have to reach across Chris and it does become kind of awkward. This is a COVID patient. I don't really don't want to put myself too close to, to their airway. So what I personally like to do is keep the ultrasound on my side. Yeah, it's not perfectly in line, but ultimately it, it is enough. And once I puncture the skin, I'm really not gonna be looking at the, the patient too much anymore. It's mostly gonna be on the monitor. The second letter on the mnemonic is U for ultrasound, ultrasound knowledge. So we have to learn how to actually operate this device. And unfortunately, there's so many different models. There's a lot of complexity to these things. So I'm gonna to try to keep it as simple as possible because frankly, I, I like simple. Let's keep things simple. To start, plug in your device. I can't tell you how often, I'm sure Chris can attest to this, where you're in the middle of putting an ultrasound guided IV and the thing crashes on you. Plug it in. 
make your life easy. So that'll be step one. Step two, turning it on. Sammy, why don't you come a little bit closer for me and I can show you up here in the upper right hand corner of the device is this little button. That's our power button. You'll see that as soon as you press that, the machine starts to wake up a little bit and you have two monitors. Again, there are many different types of ultrasounds. This is our ultrasound. We'll talk about this one specifically. This one does have two monitors. This top monitor, don't need to touch it. This one down here is actually interactive. So as you can see, we've now got the machine nice and booted up and I'll tilt the screens. That way we can kind of see both in the same shot. So to begin, we need to select the right probe, right? So probes are these devices that are attached to the machine and you can only have one selected at a time. The one that we want for this specific task is the linear probe. You'll know it because it's the skinny guy and it actually does look like a line. Whereas if you compare it to this one, this is the curved linear and this one over here is the phased array, okay? You don't need to remember that. You just need to remember, use the skinny one. Use the one that looks like a line. It's called the linear probe, all right? To begin, what you're gonna see is I'm gonna put some ultrasound gel on the probe. This is just a conductive uh, medium for the ultrasound waves. And you'll see that as soon as I did that, usually something's gonna start to show up on the screen, all right? But now we got the probe set up, we've got gel on the probe, how do we make sure that the machine knows to be using that probe and not one of these other ones? If you look at this monitor, you'll see that there are a couple things that you can select. The third selection over is the select transducer. You're gonna poke that one, and then you get all these different types. Phased array, curvilinear, this is the linear probe. Just select the Venus setting. Sometimes it'll automatically open up, sometimes you need to hit scan. So now we're, we're into the actual scanning process of using the ultrasound. You can see that we're already seeing ultrasound waves up here conducting through the medium. And down here, we have a couple more things that we can adjust. These are pretty standard across all ultrasound machines. The word gain is gonna become very important. Gain, even though it's kind of misleading, is basically talking about the brightness that comes from the ultrasound machine. So what you'll see as I, this is your gain slider, and if you look on the top screen, and as I move this to the right, what you'll see is that the screen is actually gonna to start to get brighter. And as I move back to the left, it's gonna get darker. For this procedure, we want as much light as possible. So gain, or this bottom slider, is just another way of looking at brightness. We want it as bright as possible. So that's along the X axis, if you will, for this machine. The Y axis is measuring depth. So what you'll see is if I start to select a higher a higher number basically this is going to be a shallower depth so we're looking less deep into the arm or whatever structure we're looking at if i select a lower down mark on the y-axis what you'll see is that we're actually extending deeper into the tissues for this you really if we're going to be looking in the arm you really don't need much more than the first three or four on the y-axis so we have that set up the next thing i want you to know about is actually knowing on your ultrasound probe where the indicator is. So what you'll see is there are some notches on the side on this linear probe. This notch corresponds to this marker on the monitor. In different ultrasound machines, there's a very similar thing. Sometimes it's an orange dot. Sometimes it's not a line, it's actually a dot. For our purposes, you got a line here, you got a mark there. Don't believe me, or you can't remember that, just touch the corner and what you'll see is that as I touch the left part of this device, you'll start to see some wiggling on the monitor in the same place. Lastly, as you're setting this up, so now you have your probe gelled, you have the correct gel, uh, the correct probe selected, you have the gain all the way up, you have the depth correct. The last thing I want you to remember is M mode, M. So when you hit that button, what you'll see is that there's a line that shows up right in the middle of the screen. That's gonna to correspond to the exact middle of the probe, which actually has an arrow on it. So what you'll see is if I wiggle right there in the middle, you'll see that there's gonna be some wiggling along that yellow line. That'll kind of give you an idea of where you are at any time during this procedure. The L impulse stands for long angiocath. Extra emphasis on the long part. There's a recent study in the Annals of Emergency Medicine by Ball et al. that 
basically looked at the comparison between short angio cats and longer angio cats. It actually showed that the survivability of the longer angio cats was way better than it was for the shorter angio cats. I could speculate for you. Basically, if the you have more of the cats that are in the lumen of the vessel, there's less shearing forces. Uh, to be honest, it's unclear, but it is pretty clear that they are better in terms of surviving longer in the patient. And you have to keep in mind that a lot of these patients are what we call tough sticks. We really want to do this one time, and we only want to do it one time. The more times we have to go in the room, it slows down patient care. It takes away from other things that you could be doing. But it's super important that we understand how these things work. So Sammy, if you will come a little bit closer here for me, I'm gonna actually put this in front of the sheet so hopefully you can see it a little bit better. But do not be intimidated by these devices. It still works the same way as another angiocath. So you have the needle aspect, so the sharp pointy end over here with the catheter that slides all over the top. But you have an added feature, which as I move this slider, you're gonna notice that at the end over here, a little wire is gonna pop out and it's actually got a little curly cue at the end. The reason for that is you can't cause damage with that curly cue. Why is that important? Well, if any of you know what the Seldinger technique is or are familiar with central lines and how you actually use a wire to hold positioning, what you can do is if you actually insert into the, into the, the vessel and you're having trouble advancing the, 